Welcome to CBIA's BizCast. I'm your host, Ali Warshavsky, and this week we speak with a woman who knew a lot about the real greatest showman way before 2017 when there was a blockbuster hit about him. We'd like to welcome the executive director of the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Kathleen Marr, to our podcast. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. Of course. So you're sort of a ringmaster yeah. of everything when it comes to the museum and P.T. Barnum himself. So why don't you tell us a little bit about him and why the museum is in Bridgeport? Oh, that well, that's a great question. A lot of people do think that the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport on Main Street was his house. Uh, it never was his house. Barnum actually was a museum person, and before he died, he wanted to give one final gift to his adopted home. He lived here uh, in Bridgeport, and he created what was originally called the Barnum Institute of Science and History. It was never a circus museum. Uh, that was a completely different enterprise, but he was born in Bethel. He is, he is a Connecticut native. He was born in Bethel, um, really made his, his life and his enterprise in New York City like so many people in Fairfield County, right? Things don't change. Um, but he saw Bridgeport, uh, and this is in the 1840s. He saw Bridgeport is being beautiful. The, the shoreline was beautiful. It had an active harbor. The train lines were already established. The Huntington Turnpike Company was already a primary artery through the state. So he saw this as a, as a, as a wonderful place to create a utopia, an industrialized community that welcomed people from different countries Trees, different backgrounds, different cultures that can work together to be a manufacturing hub, you know, second to New York. So that's, that's why we're here today. This was his beloved home. I have a feeling if P.T. Barnum was still around, he'd probably be an executive on our board. <laughs> and it really helps you yeah. a lot. Oh, yeah. And he's exhausting. He's been dead over 100 years, and he's the only man that exhausts me. So... <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> now, and there's a reason for that because the museum has faced its fair share of challenges. And yeah. we'll start off in 2010 when it was struck by a tornado, which you were there when it happened. And if you think Bridgeport, you usually don't think Tornado Alley either. No, and um, crazy. I, I've been here, I came to the museum in 1998. So I've been here a long time. Um, became the director in 2005, but museum went through some humps. And in 2010, you know, finances were good. A, a plan for the future was put into place. We're already go, the, the, the stock, the, the market crashed, remember the, the whole craziness. But in 2010, um, in June, uh, June tw uh, 24th, actually, at 2.15 in the afternoon, um, I was just around the corner on McCleavy Green, if you know, downtown Bridgeport. Um, I was setting up a program, you know, uh, in the Playhouse on the Green Theater, and I went outside to just walk around the block to the museum, and the sky turned, and I was like, this is well, I, I, I can wait for this to pass. So I and the uh, director of the Playhouse went back inside. He couldn't shut the door behind him. He literally I was like, Chris, what's the matter? And he goes, the door won't shut. And with that, this thunderous roar, just blocked the the outside glass door. we couldn't see anything outside and in those quick seconds my life completely turned when we could see again trees limbs were down on top of cars glass windows downtown windows are big they're like nine feet they just shattered all over the place it was like what just happened. Um, now if this happened in the Midwest everybody would be like yeah tornadoes coming what did we, what did anybody know? Everybody was outside helping people. And I was just hoping we'd see, um, you know, turning the corner, I'd see the dome still standing. And thank God, a testament to 19th century engineers, the dome was up, but the windows were blown out. The curtains were blowing, glass was everywhere. A massive tree uh, on the People's Bank property fell and just scraped in the museum. Literally, there's a third story patio on the big people's bank building where there's you know a patio for like plastic patio furniture for employees that stuff hit the historic Barnum bu building with so much force that you can still see the plastic embedded in the stone and drilled into the wood uh, moldings of the windows it, 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 there before the grace of God nobody was killed people were hurt but in the museum everybody was fine the staff was fine thank God but um 
And with that, there has not been a moment of rest trying to figure out a EF1 tornado impact on a nationally significant building uh, with collections. So yeah, tell me about those collections uh, that you said you had, was it 20,000 pieces in yeah. there they have to, that you have to worry about? And did you lose any? What happened to them? They must have been soaked or blown with the wind. That, that is so kind of you to ask. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a museum. You know, if it's an office, you throw out the furniture. You can't throw out the 4,000-year-old mummy. I, it just doesn't happen. But there were about, um, we're estimated somewhere in and about 20,000 objects, artifacts, documents, material pieces in the historic building at the time. Um, and much like a hospital, every single thing needs its own doctor, needs its own care. You don't take care of a painting the same way you take care of textiles. It's, it's completely different. So we had to quick stabilize everything. You can't touch it because also we had to deal with insurance considerations. What did happen though um, is water started pouring into the basement where we have an archives, uh, archive shelving. Never again will it be in the basement but the water started pouring in and the small staff just became a chain gang to move documents and books out of the way, laying them out flat so we could start flipping things over to air dry. Um, and sadly, one of Barnum's autobiographies from 1872 was put in a place that was missed during the rotation. And a few days later when we found it, it was just molded over. Um, so that, that was a total loss. The good thing is that Barnum had, there were so many autobiographies from 1872, we had a number of them in the collection, so that, um, so it was replaceable, but um, we still have things in conservation laboratories. Um, it, it's truly incredible. I, I mean, the most damaged object was Tom Thumb's uh, carriage from 1850s. And it's wonderful, but it's wood, it's leather, it's textile, it's metal, it's, it's composite materials. And everything is hygroscopic at a different level. So that's, and I always equate it to like the worst hair on the planet, you know? So the layers of complexity just piled up and piled up. And then um, not to bring us deeper down this hole, so that the tornado was 2010. In uh, 2011, we had to batten down the hatches for Hurricane Irene, which compounded the damage to the building. And then the following year was Superstorm Sandy. So in those three years, it was the trifecta of disasters that, that, that's just cumulative. Um, all the artifacts that were cleaned from the tornado were put into a stabled gallery that's attached to the modern gallery. Uh, Superstorm Sandy had so much force that we had a major puff back and all of those artifacts had to get cleaned again after Superstorm Sandy. You know, with all of these things that went on, it's funny because, uh, I mean, not funny for you, but you were telling me a little bit about P.T. Barnum and he did have this massive setback in his career that you said, shaped the rest of his career. So yes. you're having this setback now. The museum hasn't been open since, correct? Well, the back gallery, um, we were very grateful to the Connecticut uh, State Historic Preservation Office. They have survey and planning grants. Uh, so in the midst of working on getting the building fixed and battling insurance companies, we wrote a survey and planning grant that was awarded um, that we were able to take the back gallery where all the objects um, were stored and turn it into visible storage so we could open up to the public. So that actually happened in 2012. So we've welcomed uh, guests for just guided tours through the objects. We have interpreters because there's no story thread with Barnum that we would normally do. Um, but we'd also do programs and host mm -hmm. events. And so we've had, you know, thousands and thousands of people have come to the museum since the tornado. And it's become um, part of the disaster recovery has become part of our, our story. It's sort of embedded uh, with him. And um, aside from Barnum's financial uh, debacle, he had five major fires through his career. Um, 
Was it yeah. from the circus when they're throwing no. flames or no? <laughs> no, nothing to do with that. He embraced technology. I mean, and I'll put him into context. Barnum is born in 1810. People don't realize, it, like the Hollywood movie, couldn't work with Barnum within his own time because it doesn't make sense because he was so far ahead of his time. So he's born in 1810 when like Napoleon is still a current event. Okay. He's alive. Founding fathers are still alive. Um, and I, I said to people, the train is not invented yet when Barnum is born. So, so when you and, watch the movie, remember that, right? <laughs> yeah. When you watch the movie, remember that. Yes. He and his dad go running for the train to, to, Bethel, Connecticut, right? Or Danbury, really. Um, and you figure he's about 10 years old. That would have been 1820. The trains to that part of the state didn't happen until the 1850s. So they just catapulted him into where people think of him. People think of him as very 20th century. You know, you think 1920, Barnum is alive. He is so long dead. You know, he dies in 1891. So um, it, yeah, so he, he's an earlier figure, but um, his first American museum in New York City, mm -hmm. he opened it in 1842, way down on Broadway. Um, and because Barnum was a champion of emancipation, uh, one of the first Republicans with Horace Greeley and Abraham Lincoln, um, and the author of the amendment to expand citizenship in Connecticut, he was in the General Assembly. Um, at that time, because he was such a public and active voice um, for abolition, his American museum is allegedly, uh, was burnt down by Southern sympathizers. Okay. So that was the first one. There were a series of boiler failures. Mm -hmm. His mansion in uh, Bridgeport was actually burned down because a work person left some type of smoking uh, and it was modeled after the Brighton Pavilion in, in England. And I encourage you to Google the Brighton Pavilion in England, say, which was actually at the Klein Memorial uh, property, if, if you know Bridgeport on Fairfield Avenue. And that only lasted uh, 10 years. So he had these major disasters himself. So our disasters follow suit mm -hmm. <laughs> with the history. But um, the, the disaster that really changed him and shaped who he was uh, happens in the 1850s as well when he had a plan to industrialize Bridgeport and to catapult the project forward. He invested heavily in what was the Jerome Clock Company. And apparently um, there were financial, there was financial debt uh, that was covered up that he didn't know. So he assumed all of the debt and it completely bankrupted him. And he had to mortgage the American Museum. He put property in his wife's name early to have a woman own in incredible real estate at the time. Um, and people, at that point, he was really becoming the brand that we think of him today. And people were writing and offering to help him and he would not take charity. He, he sat back into himself and examined his life. He was a universalist. He, fully believed that things happen to you because they're meant to happen to you for learning purposes. And he writes about this. So I'm not making this up. He writes about this. And he felt that going through that, he was making money. He was all, traveling all over the world. This, this unfortunate, massive failure humanized him. And it really shapes his life from that moment forward. He looks at everything through the lens of charity you know, and instruction and, you know, lessons learned to move you forward through life. And that, that, that's nothing uh, of the way that we think about Barnum today. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, as the Barnum Museum goes through its re-envisioning, and we've had hundreds of community sessions and people talking about it, families and teachers and scholars and artists, everybody's at the table having these conversations. And we realized in the charrette, we're missing the hook. What's, what's, what's that pivotal moment in Barnum's life? And interestingly, this Jerome Clock Company debacle, which we never really thought of uh, until we did this deep dive and leaned into the, the mental health issue of that, um, that that was going to be the pivotal moment of how we're going to tell Barnum's story. So now I think almost can relate to like, 
you had these first few fires, you know, you had the tornado, the two uh, storms. And so even though we're not at five, I think the pandemic counts for two. This is kind of your fifth, right? You now have this smaller gallery where it'd be really tough to have construction on a new structure, people coming in, a person telling them a story. So hopefully this is your fifth and final, your pivotal moment, you know, how did you guys pivot during the pandemic? How did that then come into the picture and change uh, your life and the and those who visit the Barnum Museum? My, you know, thank you. you. You should come on our board. <laughs> 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 I don't think I'm not going to follow up. Um, <laughs> the, the, honestly, because we have been in disaster recovery operation for so long um, and there are patterns that happened. And, and I said to you earlier on this, this was never supposed to be in my obituary. Okay. This was never the plan in my life, but you need to, to learn how, how do you take this? You know, it could have been very easy to just throw in the towel, you know, you know, not my monkey, not my circus. <laughs> what a good fun for this one. Yeah. Who knows how to do this? And, and leaned into the early disasters very fast to figure out, it's like, we got to make this up. There is no model for this. The Barnum Museum has become not just a Connecticut or a national model, we've become a global model for disaster resilience and recovery. I have spoken to people all over the world. So with that, when the pandemic started, you know, surfacing, it was like, okay, go time, pull out the playbook. What do we have to do? So, um, worked with uh, colleagues all over the state to figure this out. I'm also on a museum committee for the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions. Okay. Barnum is actually in the uh, Hall of Fame as the founder mm -hmm. of the attractions industry, not because of the circus, but because of the museums. IAPA really is international. So all of the best ideas were coming through IAPA and we literally created in April of last year, a COVID response plan for the Barnum Museum. And I happily shared it with whoever wanted. State of Connecticut, I applied, and I, I'm gonna give a shout out to Lish Pira um, uh, with, with the SHPO office, who was brilliant at bringing people together, answering questions, dis, you know, disseminating information. So everybody came together, roll up their sleeves. So we were in this together as, as a planet, you know, not just a, a small community, it was a global community. Um, but what I did, and um, it was important to do, the, the thing that I knew is so many, so many places all over the world, really, were trying to pivot, how are we going to do this virtually? Let's do everything virtually. And I said, that's going to come. Everybody right now is worried about their personal lives. Nobody cares about the Barnum Museum's program, if it's gonna happen or not. I know, you know, it's a hard thing to yeah. say. Mm -hmm. we, we've got to map out our financials infrastructure. We have to do that now. And that's what uh, I, my assistant director, my finance committee on the board, we met a lot. It's like, how are we gonna do this? How are we going to get the word out? What are the grants? What are our opportunities? Figure out the finances. And we stuck to that for, it was up until like August, mm -hmm. we finally knew it's like, okay, we, we've got breathing space into 2021. So now let's pivot and figure out how we're going to move forward because this pandemic's not going away. Mm -hmm. So it really wasn't until August that we tried to figure out, okay, how are we going to um, the programs and on site to virtual? And that's what we've been doing right now. And uh, we're trying to raise money to really do that. A couple of, um, colleagues that work for um, a, a production company volunteered their digital skills to help us launch a YouTube channel. And we've been dedicated to that. And we're following the YouTube formulas. You know, a lot of me, it's not just putting stuff up. We're producing mm -hmm. things. Um, and another shout out to David Fay at the Bush now, because he put that idea in my head before COVID. So it was like, oh, bravo, David. So um, so, so you can see, I'm, I'm naming names, right? Um, I don't do this alone. This is a, running the Barnum Museum is a community. It's a team effort. Everybody's got to be in the boat rowing in the same direction. Um, and we've been very lucky. It's not that we don't talk about things and debate topics. That's okay. But at the end of the day, we all have that common goal. It's a unified voice. And that's really how we've been getting through the tornadoes and the hurricanes. And that's how we're getting through COVID. It's getting harder 
with COVID because the Barnum Museum and thousands of museums across the country are not eligible for certain grants. Uh, I've been going back and forth with Senator Blumenthal and Murphy's office, the shuttered venues. Yes, you're operate. saying because there's technically no performances there, so. Well, there's no fix. It's even more specific than that. There's no fixed seating. Oh, Museums that's right. rely, yeah, on flexible, flexible spaces. So you can change galleries and do different programs. So having fixed seating is, is an issue for, you know, just operations. Um, but now you're not eligible for grants. And, and uh, the Save Our Stages, we weren't eligible for too. So there's no landing place. So now we're scrambling to figure out how we fit into the American rescue. And like I said, it's the Barnum Museum. It's a lot of um, museums in Connecticut and, and across the country that are just saying, yeah. where do we go? You know, And so. a lot of them aren't, you're under construction, right? You guys are trying to build this whole new museum and experience. And yeah. that's also why you really need this grant. Yes, yes, um, yes. We, we're, we've been raising money really since the tornado, we've been in that operation. And, um, and this, is, this is an interesting thing. When any museum on the planet goes through a major re-envisioning, it is 10 to 15 years or more of planning behind the scenes. You have your think tank meetings, you bring the community voice in, you have the vision, you know, you create it, you're raising the money, okay? So when the public finds out about it, you're, it, it, it's go time, you know, and you've got two years to plan. Because we're the result of disasters, we've been in a fishbowl. So there's been no behind the scenes planning time. So people look at us and say, well, what's taking so long? And it's like, <laughs> we're just waiting for the next thing to go wrong. <laughs> it's like, you know, you know, three natural disasters, now a global pandemic, really? What's taking so long? So, um, but it's, it's like you, you breathe and you manage the perceptions because that's been a hard thing. Um, and, and then, you know, people, of course, they give, they want to see it happen right away. And it just doesn't work like that. The Barnum Museum uh, was completed in 1893. It is on the National Register of Historic Places. So we are under um, the watchful eye of the Connecticut Shippo Office, the Department of the Interior, and the National Park Services just to make the whole thing easier, right? Yeah, <laughs> so so there's just, you have to get approval for anything it, you're going to do. Everything. And I write a requisition to breathe in this place sometimes. So, <laughs> um, it, so everything that we do has to give that, and that's good. It's protecting our heritage, okay? That, that's all a good thing. So we work on it. Interestingly, back in the 1980s, when the People's Bank was building the headquarters, the architect, Richard Meyer, wanted to demolish the building. If you're familiar, yeah, and this is only in 1989. Um, he wanted to level it because it didn't fit with his very modern work. And the Department of the Interior National Park stepped in and they were like, no. And then he said, well, we have to whitewash it. And they said, no. <laughs> but they, they didn't put the amount of energy into the repair and the re restoration of the building that was really needed back then. So we're facing a lot of old damage that was uncovered when we had to gut the building and, and, and find, you know, deficiencies in some of the work that was done. You can't, you, you, we can't, we can't move forward with that. It's not healthy. You know, it's certainly not energy efficient. Um, so we're backtracking. So the building is really getting the most love it has seen probably since the 1890s. <laughs> so About time, yeah. So, so sometimes I have to dig my heels in and as hard as it is, and nobody wants this done more than me. Um, and just say, got to do it right. Got to do it right for the future. It's about the future. It's not about me and us and everybody in my boat. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, about, it's about you and it's about your children and your family and their children. This has been around 120 years. My job is for who's next. Now, do you think because there was this movie made, um, you know, The Greatest Showman, did that bring more attention to your museum? You mentioned that they actually came and met with you to discuss P.T. Barnum's life. And although the movie might not be exactly accurate to it, they did want to talk to you about him. Yeah, yeah, they did. And, and the first time they reached out, believe it or not, was 2009. 
Wow. So when you Jackman says, it's like, I've been trying to get this done for a long time. That's true because I still have that email. Another um, similarity to the museum taking mm-hmm. a long time, right? It, it takes years. <laughs> it, it, exactly. It takes a long time to put these things together and find the investors. Anyway, um, the uh, 20th Century Fox uh, came out before they, they were filming already, but they came out to the museum and, and I, I give them credit because the production people and the marketing people, they needed the Barnum Museum to be supportive, okay, you know, or else then they have to go into, you know, you know, publicity, you know, triage to fix something that the Barnum Museum director says. Mm-hmm. So they came and the first thing they said was, and it was so funny, I'll never forget it. She goes, it's not a documentary. And it was like, okay, so let's, let's start there. And they were absolutely true to what they said about it. It's like, we're not trying to put him into a linear path because as I said, he doesn't make sense in his linear path. We want to capture his spirit. We want to capture how he made people feel, you know, and I'll be gosh darn if they didn't do that perfectly. The music, you know, it just all came together. I mean, I would, after the movie came out, I'd be in my office and like I said, the gallery would be open and people break into song. I mean, I was ready for Gene Kelly to come fly. (laughs) But, But people would just start singing. So it elevated people absolutely. And to this day, because it's on Disney plus and it is on regular TV, um, it elevated people's awareness of Barnum, even if it was, if it's, if it's not Barnum history, it's not actually history history. They don't get history right, okay? But it doesn't matter, but it gets people to, to that place. And we created a program because uh, we had to respond to it uh, with all the conversations with them. And so we created uh, Fiction versus Fact, the real story behind the real story, or EEL story. Um, and the first time we did it, the, the museum gallery, we were at standing room only. We were at standing room only because people wanted to know. And that was the win for us. You know, that was the win. And when people hear that the train isn't invented, no, we don't think about the train. You think it's always there, right? It's always a form of, of transportation, you know? We're, we're still battling, you know, train funding. But, um, but there it is. There was a moment in time when you just didn't even have this. So I made me look at when Barnum was born, even the Erie Canal wasn't even operating. <laughs> so, so, so it's interesting. So 20th Century Fox did a, a brilliant job in, in heightening people's awareness of Barnum. And we are doing everything that we can to take that, that little bit of knowledge and take it to the next level. You don't even know what you don't know, right? And um, there's, there's a Barnum quote, they didn't use it in the movie, but uh, he writes um, about his museum in New York City. The one end aimed at is to make men and women think, talk, and wonder. And as a practical result, go to the museum, <laughs> right? It's st- that works for every museum. I, I, I should, I'm giving it to every museum person out there. Well, and that kind of leads me into my last question of, you know, he he has all these quotes. It's funny, the other day I was actually looking online for, I wanted to see some of the quotes he said and some of them ring so true um, about life. But, and it made me think when I, that I was going to ask this question, well, this is kind of why, you know, why is it so important to remember him? I think that a lot of us, um, we picture the circus, right? We picture the elephants and the fire and the weird clowns and the tent, but he was so much more than that. And that's exactly why he was successful. And that's exactly why you work so hard to inform the public about him. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And um, usually when I do my, my talks about Barnum, I always start because very often it's, it's retirees uh, that are listening. The circus is Barnum's retirement project. <laughs> he was over 60 when that idea came to him. His, his, his love and his passions that he writes about, always his museums. So he opens the first American Museum Broadway in 1842. It is the country's first aquarium. It is the first science center. They had all types of technologies happening. Uh, Inventions were at the museum. So when people think about Barnum, they put him firmly into the idea of the freak show. And that is, he's dead. Any people that were performers, um, they were marvels of nature or natural wonders. And that could have been a ballerina. And it was because there was no such thing as ballet in this country before. So you're seeing things that we just sort of like, oh, well, really? 
to it. And it's interesting to know too, when Barnum opened the American Museum, any kind of entertainment and theater going was not considered appropriate for women and children at all. This is, this is, this is gritty New York. This is the Bowery. This was Irish immigration. There were, uh, theaters were violent. There was drinking, you know, there was prostitution. It was, it was not good. Barnum took that idea, opened uh, the American Museum. You weren't allowed to drink or smoke at all in his establishment. If you wanted to, you had to leave and pay full price to get back in. It was promoted as moral, wholesome family entertainment. The first time we see family entertainment is at his American Museum. So he transformed the public mind through these these types of entertainments, um, it, you know, artifacts, art, it, you name it, it was at the American Museum. Um, the, the Barnum Museum here today is a reflection of that. Um, when, before he died, the, the intention was to make a sizable donation to the Bridgeport YMCA. And I love our friends at the YMCA, um, but they did not like his universalist beliefs. So he took his money back and said, I'm going to create my final gift to the city of Bridgeport and create this museum. So a lot of the collections that we have go all the way back to the 1890s. So like I said earlier, it was never his house. It has always been a functioning public museum. It was, it, his museums were for every, everybody, not just the educated and the elite. It was a public institution. So well, big legacy to carry forward. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to watch The Greatest Showman with a completely different mindset now, you know, um, and just when you see when the circus has finally come back to town, you just think of it a little bit differently and more like a hard work uh, adventure for him that I will not be doing in my retirement, that's for sure. That will not be the first thing I think of to start a circus. Mm -hmm. People look at me and they were like, as soon as you stop talking, I'm going to play golf. What do you mean it's retirement project? You know? So it is, it is really funny, but that's the hook. That's the sort of, those are the ways that we're going to be telling Barnum's story in, in the future museum when we get the funding and we reopen. It's going to be through themes, not, not just he did this in 1820, he did this in 1840. It's going to be, you know, illumination through curiosity, success through innovation, Okay, isn't that we're firmly nestled in that today? That's Barnum's life. So to find his story, tell it through his emotional challenges that we can all relate to today. Um, so rebound from failure. You know, we can all relate to that. So I want to to get myself so emotionally invested in the story that you leave transformed, that you leave here and carry something new forward. Well, we look forward to following the progress of this and and fingers crossed there are no natural disasters or other pandemics that come your way. But I'm sure if you did, you could write, you know, like you said, you have the manual written out on it now. I'm telling and if you face something, call me. I've I've done nothing if I don't pay this forward <laughs> and help anybody that that needs a little bit. I, I do that all the time. So I'm always here. I'm always here. <laughs> Well, thank you, Kathleen. And thank you for everyone who has been listening to this week's CT BizCast. You can listen and subscribe to our podcast on Apple, YouTube, and for more episodes, head over to CBIA.com.